So today we're going to be starting a multi-part series on the amendments to the Constitution, uh, specifically the first two 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights. We're going to kind of go in depth on each of them, talk about why they were included, uh, what kind of the writers of the Constitution uh, were trying to accomplish, uh, antecedents to the amendment itself, and issues that have arisen since the ratification of the Bill of Rights as far as interpretation of the amendments. Join us today on an incomplete history for an in-depth discussion of the First Amendment. Hello and welcome to an incomplete history. I'm Hillary. And I'm Jeff. We're your hosts for this weekly history podcast. So, uh, good evening, Hillary. Hello, how you doing? Pretty good. You've been gallivanting all over the uh, southeast this weekend. Yeah, just been on little road trips here and there, so feeling a little tired, but okay. Uh, run into any snow? Any interesting weather? Um, there was rain our entire drive. We were driving... Um, across Tennessee and it rained the entire time we were driving. So that wasn't fun, but at least it wasn't snow or ice. It wasn't no. And that's great, but it, it was dangerously close to that. It was very foggy, which I think Tennessee is famous for, right? Is that, yeah. Uh, so it was a little dangerous out there and the roads, I'm not used to the roads still out here where it's not a 12 lane highway and you're going on these roads and it's just like, you're going one way and then the other people are going the other way and there's nothing that separates you, you know, and it's just like <laughs> zooming past each other. And I'm still not used to that. And there's no lights. Like I think we should talk about Southern infrastructure one day because it's totally different than other places. And well, there's, there's, there's a big kind of, bo- right. There's like a big body of, of scholarship on that, right. About, yeah. uh, kind of the new South and the rise of that and everything. But uh, yeah, well, we got an inch of rain last week. I heard. So is Fashion Valley flooded? No, it didn't flood. I mean, they had to close a couple of the roads for a little bit. Uh, I mean, I know listeners listen to this. They're like an inch of rain. Uh, That is one twentieth of our annual rainfall total. And it shut down. Yeah. I mean, if we have 19 more storms like that, will be on an average rainfall year. And they're anticipating significantly more than that. So how many we'll car accidents were there? All over the place. How long it was insane. Um, I had to come up with imaginative ways to drive home when it's faster for me to drive home on local roads through La Jolla, uh, Pacific beach, <laughs> That's a nice uh, drive, mission though. beach. Um, do what? It's a nice drive. It's very scenic. I used to do that. It's just nice. To enjoy seeing the the water. Yeah, and stuff. but if that's faster than me just driving down the five, which is normally like a fifteen minute drive, like it was two hours the other day. That's a problem. Um, yeah, that's a big problem. So anyway, today we're talking about the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, and and maybe the Bill of Rights more generally, right? Um, just kind of what these things were, but. Uh, the First Amendment's pretty dense. There's a lot to it. There's, there's, there's the fact that it has so many parts almost makes me think that it should have each part should have been its own amendment. But it's interesting, right? You wonder why. So some of the amendments are kind of very specific, um, and really tightly focused. Whereas the First Amendment is a lot of stuff. So. I mean, let me start by kind of just reading what the First Amendment says. So this is what it says. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, comma, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, semicolon, or abridging the freedom of speech, comma, or of the press, semicolon, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, comma, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances, period. And I know it sounds kind of weird, me reading the punctuation, but I think that punctuation is important, right? So we've got kind of three distinct parts. So we've got the religion, 
and free exercise thereof. We've got free speech or of the press. And then we've got this people to peacefully assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances. Yeah, all that punctuation is important because it does uh, it does break it into these sections. And again, why they aren't their own amendment, because like you said, some are just so specific that it's odd that they would group all of these into the very first one. But I think it's because it's kind of like a tie for first. That's a, I mean, I think maybe that's a good kind of thesis, right? That maybe you had multiple people arguing, but I mean, James Madison, who's the primary architect of the constitution, he initially opposes a bill of rights. Well, but then when does he change his mind? Well, I mean, <laughs> when, when, when daddy said so, right. And I mean, Thomas Jefferson, and I don't mean literally his dad, but He was so heavily influenced by Thomas Jefferson and Jefferson was the one who was mostly behind this. And he kind of sends Madison out as his minion, like go write these. And and Madison kind of has to get on board. Well, but I mean, Madison initially, um, you know, he said uh, it was a parchment barrier that if we put these rights down on to paper, it could actually lead to more problems than it would solve. And the idea was that once you specified things, people would say, well, it's not in here, so you don't really have that right. Um, But Jefferson famously writes – he doesn't attend the Constitutional Convention. And December of 1787, he writes this letter to Madison, and he says, you know, if you don't include this Bill of Rights – it's a it's going to be a big deal because a bill of rights, quote, a bill of rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth. And I think that's an interesting place to start with, right? So Jefferson, so what did Jefferson want? So Jefferson's an anti-federalist, right? He wanted to prevent the power of the federal government from um lording over the people because they had just fought to get away from a strong federal central government of the monarchy, right? And they were heavily invested in making sure that that wasn't going to be the case for this brand new government. And so to secure these fundamental rights were, was so important to so many people in order to sign on to the new, the new government. Yeah. So, you know, this, the people versus the government is this long thing, you know, this long tradition in English and British history. And the Bill of Rights just doesn't come out of anywhere. It has kind of pretty lengthy antecedents um, going all the way back, arguably to Magna Carta, right? Yeah. And, and also just it's created out of precedent of understanding what went wrong with the last government. Right. And I think the interesting part about the bill of rights, it's not about the government giving you rights. It's not about that at all. It's not about the government is allowing you to do this. The the point of the Bill of Rights is these are God-given, inalienable rights that every human being possesses. And so it's not about what is the government allowing of us, but what we are stopping the government from getting involved in with our own lives and our individual rights and freedoms that it has nothing to do with we should be thankful that the government has given this to us, but that they're fleshing out very clearly. The government is not allowed to get involved in these aspects. Right. Well, so, I mean, let me let me start with Magna Carta. Because um, I think understanding how can we move from Magna Carta to John Locke and the Glorious Revolution, finally to Virginia's declaration of rights kind of sets up a good background for how we end up with the bill of rights and why they look how they look. So the Magna Carta, uh, 1215, um, the great charter, the Magna Carta, uh, was a document that was basically England's King John was forced to sign. Um, his barons were rebelling against him and he agreed to sign this and it doesn't give freedom to average English citizens at all. That's not what it is about at all. It's about 
this nobility being able to check the power of the king. And I mean, this is an interesting start because that has nothing to do with our Bill of Rights as far as the way it looks. But most legal historians would say this is kind of the kernel. Um, so what does the Magna Carta do? Well, uh, you know, it's written in Latin, which still in 1215 is what you would write an important document like this. And um, it's got 63 clauses. Most of them are about property rights of barons. Uh, it also doesn't really talk about average landless people. Um, and it has to get expanded on later in kind of English legal history. But uh, Clause 39 of the Magna Carta says, no free man shall be imprisoned or deceased, which is not deceased like dead, but D-I-S-S-E-I-S-E-D, that's kind of dispossessed, um, except by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. This is key, right? I mean, this is pretty spectacular. This is the little nugget that starts it all. I think it is. It's it like is. the oh, king sure. just can't the king just can't arrest somebody and throw them in the clink. And what's crazy about it is that this was so revolutionary and that people hadn't really thought about this before. And then suddenly they're like, hey, wait a minute. People shouldn't be allowed to just be arrested for no reason. This is revolutionary political thought and advancement in society. Yeah. And then we get the clause right after it that says, to no one will we sell, to no one will we deny or delay right or justice. It's pretty big. Um, you know, I I get I get chills because I just I'm amazed that that this document that's really not meant to protect the rights of all people maybe accidentally includes something that is going to benefit many people. That's what's so funny about this document and then others. It's that they were not designed to benefit everybody. And right. they weren't even thinking that it was going to, they were trying to cover their own interests and they were writing it in their own, you know, language of attempting to, well, we need to make sure that everything's, good for us, but then ultimately it ends up being blanket protections for everyone. And it was never intended in that way. And it, with, of course, the Magna Carta, which you're talking about, but then later on documents, founding documents, in the United States, they were never intended to benefit everybody. And so if you think about any of the, um, any of the Bill of Rights, it was not intended to cover or assist or benefit um, poor people non-property holders, right? Uh, right. Anybody who's enslaved, most certainly free black people, women, um, anybody who was non-Christian, it just wasn't designed to help them. And then it ultimately, you know, because it's drafted and it's so it's canon, it does end up helping other people. And it's interesting that you say it gives you chills. Cause I'm like, I guess I'm, I'm not that faithful of a historian. Cause I didn't, I didn't get the chills, but like, I get, I get what you're saying is like, it's super important document that, that does end up offering the basis for everything else. Now there's, there's stuff going on too, with parliamentary law after the Magna Carta, right in the 14, 15, 16 centuries where like it's built upon and strengthened. And then that also mm -hmm. is kind of a basis for what goes forward with the United States and building a new government. Cause it's not like they're starting from scratch. They do have no, no, not ideas. at all. Yes, yeah, yeah. So we get, yeah. I mean, this this document. So first, the Magna Carta undergoes some revisions um, and gets expanded on, um, and kind of the next four hundred years of the of kind of British legal or English legal history is interesting. But I mean, we want to get to the actual amendments of the that we're going to talk about. So I'm going to fast forward to John Locke because I think he's the next kind of super key piece in this puzzle about yeah. why they come up with this thing. So Locke is born, um, his parents are Puritan. 
He's raised as a Puritan. He's born in 1632. Um, his father's well connected, and he's also loyal uh, to the government because his father served as a captain during the English Civil War. So he's a roundhead. Um, and so Locke is well educated. He eventually attends Christ Church at Oxford. And he takes logic, metaphysics classes, classical languages. And uh, kind of returns, does a Master of Arts program there, um, is elected to the Royal Society, gets a degree in medicine. Um, he really is, you know, um, a polymath, right? He's He's got interests all over the place. But the most important thing he does is he writes this two treatises of government. And he talks about the natural rights of man and the social contract. And he argues um, the social contract says people agree to submit to the authority of a government in exchange for that government protecting their interests. So a government is not supposed to be this kind of parasitic, um, have this parasitic relationship with its its citizens, nor is it supposed to have an adversarial relationship. Uh, Locke gets in a lot of trouble. Um, this writing is not seen by supporters of King Charles II as very good. Uh, Locke gets kind of wrapped up in this Rye House plot, and he eventually has to go to Holland. He's exiled in Holland. He writes a little bit more there. But then we get the Glorious Revolution in 1688. And he's able to come back. And the Glorious Revolution is kind of the next big moment in this, right? Because the Glorious Revolution, where it was the English people asserting they had a right to remove a king. And they did. Huge moment. And also makes a lot of sense why there becomes a mass migration to the United States, because it's not received well. It's not, you know. I mean, this is the thing. There's a lot of people who do not like this, right? They don't like this. This is an upending of the social order. Um, you know, and what's important, and this is a lot of my students struggle with this, you know, it's the King of England, the idea of divine right was kind of a nascent thing at this point. It really wasn't strong, right? And a lot of people misunderstand and think European, especially Western European monarchs, had this divine right thing all the way back. And that's not really true. That kind of comes um, out during Henry VIII, right? Because yes, he's feuding yeah. with the church. It, it and starts to, right. Yeah. So that, right. that's 17th, you know, I guess late 16th century stuff. But I mean. Right. Yeah, well, but I mean, you could that. argue that, right, you could argue that Henry's uh, de declaring himself head of the Church of England may have opened the door for them saying, well, if he can intrude in kind of religious matters like that, then maybe the parliament has to have a, the ability to kind of remove a king. Yeah, because um, otherwise he's like an all-powerful sorcerer or something, right? Because it's like, if you're not answering to anybody, you're not even answering to God, right? Then you become the papal authority in a way. And they were upset about that. Right. I mean, so. Right. It's. Yeah. Well, I mean, the biggest, so the biggest thing is, and it's funny, like we talk about this anti-Catholic sentiment. Um, king James II, who is the king who gets dethroned during the glorious revolution. Uh, he is Catholic. And a lot of English do not like this. They don't like having a Catholic king. You know, England has gone through now a hundred plus years of religious war on and off. And uh, the parliament, they're able to kind of replace him with his daughter, Mary. She's Protestant. She was raised Protestant and her husband who's Dutch and his name's William of Orange. And they form this giant monarchy and they negotiate. Parliament has a lot of power at that point. And we in, up with something called the English Bill of Rights. It's officially known as the, an act declaring the rights and liberties of the subject and settling the succession of the crown. Um, 
And it kind of starts out with a condemnation of James II for abusing his power. And it says the monarchy cannot rule without the consent of parliament. So it's a giant turning point for the function of government for the British, but it also serves as a launch pad for people who have at this point are in the colonies. And of course, William and Mary is named for who you just spoke of, right? Um, Queen yeah. Queen William. And, and so this sentiment that's kind of ruminating around is really heartily uh, taken into account by people who have colonized this new area, right? The new world in the Northeast of um, New England. And so that political sentiment is, is soaked up. Right. And then, and, and that's, it makes sense right at this time that there starts to be these stirrings toward um, wanting, wanting their own government. And I mean, it's not, I wouldn't argue that they're starting that at the moment, but it's definitely their seeds planted because of the revolutionary discussions about politics and about governing and governance that it becomes generational legacy of kind of revolutionary political thought. Yeah. You know, it's, there are kind of these little mini rebellions that break out on the colonies as well, though, as people kind of hear news of this, there's kind of this general disgruntled atmosphere towards the kind of social hierarchies in the colony. Um, This is, you know, uh, when people start to reassess their relationship with their local governments, um, but the the English Bill of Rights itself, it's important to note, includes a couple of key provisions. Um, The king and queen or queen can't interfere in the free election of parliament, of members of parliament. There's free speech in parliament. Um, uh, The king, the crown cannot interfere with the law. You have the right to petition the king. You have the right to bear arms for self-defense. Aha. You have freedom from cruel and unusual punishment and excessive bail, freedom from taxation by royal prerogative without the agreement of parliament. So this gives parliament the power of the purse string, right? Freedom of fines and forfeiture, freedom from fines and forfeitures without a trial and freedom from armies being raised during peacetime. Um, They also clarify that Roman Catholics can't be king or queen. Uh, Parliament should meet frequently and that when Mary died, uh, succession would pass to Princess Anne of Denmark, Mary's sister and her heirs rather than the heirs of William. So this is the idea that they wanted to, you know, they're willing to have William kind of sit on the throne with Mary, but they want to keep this with English people after Mary dies. So Mary's children with William are not going to ascend to the crown of the throne, but. And that, that edict that non, you know, people who aren't, who are Catholic are not allowed that position that kind of settled at this point, more than a century of debate over religious uh, leadership within the region, because there are some people who are supportive of the Catholics and some who are not. And so to, to kind of set that establishment immediately there after they're, they're, that's settled at that point. Right. Well, I mean, there's this whole idea that any time a Catholic cr- leader would take the throne, it threw into doubt what would happen to Protestants. Right. Well, it allowed in other European powers to coerce or be included in or considered in British domestic policy. And well, Mary Queen of Scots uses a French army, right? Exactly. So a French army and then also the Spanish. Um, there's most certainly more um, activity with the greater European continent when there is a Catholic monarch. And it's because they end up teaming up with these other countries who are predominantly Catholic. So now we kind of move from 1688 forward to 1776. And So June 12th, 1776, Virginia's Constitutional Convention convenes almost a month before um, kind of the Declaration of Independence is going to be written in Philadelphia and at it kind of lays down a Declaration of Rights. 
And Jefferson draws heavily on this document for his Declaration of Independence, which, unlike the Constitution, does assert people have certain rights, correct? Yeah, but are you asserting that Thomas Jefferson has plagiarized the document? Um, I don't think he's plagiarizing it. I just think he's like looking at it and saying, oh, that's pretty good. That sounds I mean, like plagiarism to me. I mean, I, that sounds like a case of plagiarism. But I, 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 mean, I guess it is. I mean, it is. It's. I think what I'm trying to get from there, though, is that these ideas are not coming out of nowhere. That right. this sort of political sentiment and this sort of revolutionary um, idea of governance has has been present for a long time, and that they are drawing on one another and growing and learning and deciding, you know, how it's actually going to be fleshed out. And so it's a collective effort. And and I think that's important because a lot of people don't know who George Mason is. And so you, you talk about him and it's like, oh, he was actually really involved in Jefferson's thinking. And um, it wasn't like he just went off by himself. I mean, he did actually go and write it all out. And I've seen the house that he wrote the Declaration of Independence in, of course, it's in Philadelphia. And that's really neat, but it's not like he's just pulling these ideas out of the clear blue sky. Right. Well, and I think the, the, the big thing is, is he is, uh, George, yeah, I mean, George Mason's interesting. He may be one of the most important colonial era figures that most people don't know much about. Yeah. I mean, our, he is the author. The he's the, he's right. He's the primary architect of the constitution. He's the one who's kind of able to make something that, you know, for the most part has continued to function to this day. Um, but I mean, what's really interesting. So there are 16 sections in this declaration of rights, the Virginia declaration of rights and section 16 says religion or the duty, which we owe our creator and the manner of discharging it can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. And therefore all men are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience, and that it is the mutual duty of all to practice Christian forbearance, love, and charity towards each other. So this seems to be directly reflected in Article 1, or the First Amendment, right? Absolutely. Yeah. and But there's a little distinction there. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. There's for sure a distinction. It says very specifically in that document that it's Christian, and Christianity and, and stemming. Well, I mean, is that what it's saying? I think so. And I mean, I think that the first amendment was designed for Protestant Christians because habitually throughout time, so many people of different religions are persecuted and not just persecuted, but forcibly converted. I mean, it's not written, but it that's what ends up being the practice of it. If that right, if that ex- that doesn't excuse it, but I think that that's well the issue. But what if that last that last phrase? Um, it is the mutual duty of all to practice Christian forbearance, love, and charity towards each other. What if that instead means, look, you can f- freely practice whatever religion you want, but at the end of the day, you still have to adhere to these three Christian concepts. So then that's not having a freedom of religion at all. Because well, you don't, is ascribe it? to, I don't know. What if you don't ascribe to those sorts of ideals? I mean, I, ideally, I guess. Well, I mean, maybe that's to be not right. I mean, each other, but. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the thing though. I think that, I think kind of an expansive reading of this would be that, you know, any any religion, as long as it incorporates something that looks like Christian forbearance, love, and charity towards each other, is fine. But if your religion doesn't include those three things, then it's maybe not fine. However, we cannot force you um, to convert, right? Um, I mean, it's an odd thing. And, you know, we don't have a clear idea. We do know that Thomas Jefferson is an early advocate for no official state religion. Most right? founding fathers were, and that's something that we've uncovered and discussed. And it was very popular discussed in the early 2000s about that 
the founding fathers were actually quite opposed to organized religion and have a lot to say about that. And that's one of the things Bill Maher brings up in that documentary, I don't know, religious, it's old, but he talks a lot about that. It's just like, they didn't, they weren't outright religious people and they didn't want everybody to be religious. And this whole idea about, you know, practicing kindness toward one another, whatever it said, it's as if, you know, humans need Christianity in order to figure that out. But it's like, no, I don't, I don't think that Christianity is what makes people be kind to one another. I think it's just like, generally humans are like, Hey, let's not kill each other and steal each other's stuff. Right. Right. I, I guess that's well, but I mean, philosophical, but when we're thinking about freedom of religion and the first amendment and all this, it's like, I think it's so heavily predicated on Christianity yet. It's not because so many of the founding fathers didn't, they weren't utterly or outrightly religious. Well, I mean, a lot of them are deists, right? So they believed God was this great clockwork maker, and he kind of created the universe and everything in it, set it in motion, and then just kind of went and did other projects. Yeah, he's kind of got um, Right. And I, here's the thing as I try to do with this is like Mason and Jefferson and all these people, even even kind of the the least religious amongst them, still lived in a world where the vast majority of people they saw every day were Christian of some type. And I think, you know, I don't know what I think. I mean, it's this Christian forbearance, love and charity thing. It's like, I mean, a narrow reading is, yeah, Mason saying, yeah, but you got to be Christian. You can be any flavor of Christian you want to be, but you got to be Christian. Or he's saying, you can be anything you want to be, but you have to incorporate these three things that we think, I mean, maybe what he's saying, and this is the last section of the Virginia Declaration, maybe he's saying, you know, our society needs forbearance, love, and charity between people to work. It's not going to work otherwise. And that's the I mean, argument, it's, though, is that do you right. need Christianity to say that? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think it would have been hard for somebody like Mason to separate morality from religion, right? Um, and you go back one section to section 15, and it says, no free government of the blessings of liberty can be preserved to any people, but by a firm adherence to justice, moderation, temperance, frugality, and virtue, and by frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. I mean, fundamental principles. Thanks, George. What is our James? Have I been saying George Mason? I think I have. I mean, James Mason. Uh, James Madison. James Madison. You got everything all messed up now. James Madison, George Mason, Thomas. George Mason. Mason. Those are the three different. Right. <laughs> These are different. James people. Madison. Yes. James Madison is the guy I'm talking about, not George Mason. Um, but I mean, this fundamental principles, like what does what does that mean? That's what ends up being such a huge problem in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Like, there's some, there is ambiguity, and it's left to interpretation. And different people can vehemently argue one way or the other. And I don't know if they did it on purpose. Sometimes I think yes, they did it on purpose. But also, it's like, do you know the problems you've caused? Do you know? Right. I mean, it's like they either do it on purpose or maybe they do it because they all kind of agreed in their minds what they meant by fundamental principles and thought it was self-evident. Well, and we talked about that in an earlier episode, right? Where, the, where I think we were talking about uh, the high crimes and misdemeanors. I think. That's right. What but saying that they knew what they meant because this was common everyday language and it was just generally understood that there, it didn't need further explanation because they're just like, Oh yeah, we're all on the same page about that. But to a 21st century reader, we don't use those phrases. And so that's not at the tip of our tongue to explain something. And so then we have, then we're forced because we don't use that phrase and it's not a part of our common lexicon. We end up going and breaking down each word of it and trying to take it as literally as possible. And then that's kind of, I think that's what ends up causing the problems. But to them, it's very possible that it, it wasn't ambiguous at all. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, 
that's the thing is I, I think the easiest explanation and the one that makes the most sense is it's not ambiguous. They know what they mean by fundamental principles. For us, that's a little vague, right? We want something that's more concrete. Um, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or the free or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Um, that's a, that's a modification of what's in Virginia's declaration, right? Uh, there's no mention of Christian values of those, you know, forbearance, love and charity. Um, so, I mean, maybe this is the thing is that Madison takes the document he had already written and kind of crafts this new version where he maybe takes a little ambiguity out. Um, and definitely some of the colonies are more religious than others, right? That those people in charge are more religious. Um, some of the colonies have kind of relatively long histories of religious plurality, whereas some of the colonies are very mono-religious, right? There's basically one religion. Um, let's move to the second kind of phrase. You ready to move to freedom of speech? Oh, yeah. yeah, for sure, yeah. At this one, and that's what I was getting scared of. I was like, oh my gosh, we haven't even covered speech yet, and we're already at 37 minutes. So, yeah, let's, yeah, let's get there. Let's get there. Sir, so, section 12 of Virginia's Declaration that the freedom of the press is one of the great bulwarks of liberty and can never be restrained but by despotic governments. Bill of Rights or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. So, this is Congress shall make no law respecting or abridging the freedom of law or the freedom of the press. So pretty cut and dry, right? You would think, yeah. But I don't think, yeah, <laughs> I don't think that one's as contested as just speech in general has been recently. But uh, that one is super important for the Bill of Rights and for the formation of this new government because, and this is something that the British still struggle with, they don't have freedom of the press there. I think a lot of people are totally shocked to know that, but they don't. Right. The Queen, well, it's, more than one right. of them, has forbade the, the press to print stuff. And I mean, I'm wondering if she's like, doing major damage control right now because of Andrew and has tried so hard. <laughs> I'm serious. But like, historically that's, that's been their problem is like they do not have freedom of the press. Right. Well, so freedom of speech in the English bill of rights is in parliament, in parliament, in parliamentary meetings. If you're a member of parliament, you have a right to speak your mind. That doesn't extend outside of parliament. Right. So that allows freedom. just for a specific class of people to speak, right? The aristocracy, right. politicians, right? Right. So then kind of something we have to bring up is the Bill of Rights as initially envisioned and until kind of some night, uh, kind of mid 20th century cases, it really only applies to an individual and their relationship with the federal government. It doesn't generally apply to state governments and the individual. And it's not until we get a series of cases. Uh, one of the most famous is Griswold versus Connecticut, right? This idea that, um, and that has to do with the Ninth Amendment. And we'll talk about that when we get to that episode. But this idea that um, this is the, the individual citizen and their relationship with the, the federal government. So does the First Amendment prohibit uh, protect you free speech versus a state government? Eh? Who knows? Unclear. Right? Unclear at this time. And unclear. What about to another person? Right. Well, but it, it's also just um, it's important to think about they're trying to appease people to get them to sign on, and so it is unclear. I would say for that reason is to say well. Is it the state or the federal government who gets to make those decisions? And that's what ends up being, to this day, there are cases about that, right? It's like, well, is it the state or is it the federal? Is it the state or is it the federal? And, right. and in this case, it is. It's totally unclear. 
Right. Well, and I think this thing is the so religion is the first thing they're thinking about, and the freedom of speech and the press is the next one. Um, and I think the reason they do that is it's so important in the revolution itself, in the period of time leading up to the revolution, kind of bolstering and uh, kind of supporters of revolution, as well as kind of um, helping people understand what they want to accomplish. The press is critical, right? And I think they value the press's role in that. Now, what's interesting is the First Amendment is going to get trounced on every time we go to war after this. Right. Yeah, with the Alien and Sedition Acts, and and yeah, I mean, you I just can't. Right, it, it, was, was the most right. But but the with this too though is thinking about the. Gosh, I, I'm sorry. I forgot what I was going to say. Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> I mean, it's it's you know, it's. I think it is a little more cut and dry, but at the same time, it's. Where is the religious one? You know, the United States has not successfully banned any specific religion. They've tried. Um, and they've definitely, there are some groups, especially kind of in the early part of the 19th century, that have to try to move outside the U.S.'s jur- jurisdiction. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the Mormons, right? I mean. Yeah, they had to go to their own land. But that a lot of that is state governments they're contending with. It's not the federal government necessarily, well, although Lincoln, the federal government. Lincoln, go ahead. Involved. Lincoln gets involved in that, right? And oh yeah, yeah. Well, later, yeah, yeah. Lincoln, yeah. Yeah. Lincoln gets very involved. Yeah. Um, so you know, it's it. I think one thing that's important for listeners to understand is most of these amendments get challenged at various points. And the Supreme Court eventually has to step in and kind of say, well, what's kind of meant by this? Um, You know, so you've got religion, you've got this freedom of speech and the press, and then you've got this last part of the First Amendment, the right of people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Can't go back. What does that mean? Because I remember what I was going to say now. About yeah, let's go back to freedom. Of, really, let's go back to freedom of press. Is yeah, the, you would mention that it's important because they're coming out of the revolutionary era, and that was one of the biggest beefs with the British government was the Stamp Act, and that required you to have like a stamp or a seal on every single piece of paper you had, and so it really limited what people could say, what they could write, what they could publish based on their class status and their access to money. And so, yeah, well, anything printed, set, anything, anything printed, anything printed, any piece of paper had to have a stamp on it. Um, and so, this cost a lot of money. And so, it was just, I think that that was one of the things that upset the colonists the most. And then the importance of the pamphlets uh, in circulating ideas about revolution and circulating ideas about new governance it would just became colossally important to spreading the message. And so that one does become so near and dear. And you're right. It it gets challenged a lot, particularly in the 1790s because they're uncomfortable with it, but they also do know how important it is. Right. Well, I mean, here's, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, so when I, the, the stamp act is great. Stamp act is in 1765 and the way I usually teach the Stamp Act is uh, who can you not afford to join the rebellion? Uh, it's the lawyers. And the Stamp Act basically pisses off all the lawyers in the colonies. Since every piece of paper has to have this stamp on it, lawyers, people who write, uh, printers, these are all the people who are going to be effect- affected by this. It's a really short-sighted solution, right? By the crown. Yeah, um, they're it's, the most educated, right? And so they're the ones. Yeah, it's like it's like you know. Yeah. And at this point, you know, maybe they're not. Many of those people who are very well educated and kind of in these professions where they use paper a lot. You know, I think it's you know a majority of them are not in favor of independence. 
And then they do this and they just manage to piss off a huge group of people. And group of so I think and wealthy of people. Yeah. Powerful, wealthy people with access to printing presses. Yes. Yeah. And, and the will to use like them. <laughs> I mean, it's so stupid, right? It's so like, come on, could you have done anything more idiotic? Um, and, <laughs> You know, um, what I think is funny is in February of 1765, um, there's this meeting that takes place. Um, you know, British officials are discussing this prospective Stamp Act. Benjamin Franklin's there. Um, and the uh, British official, Grenville, says, oh, this is the most easy and least objectionable to the colonies. Like, this is just like, this will oh. be fine. Thomas Watley, who drafts it, um, says it's out of tenderness to the colonies. That's that's really good. I love that quote. Whenever I, the <laughs> next time I do something absolutely stupid, I'm be like, it's out of tenderness. It's just out yeah, of- it's just like, it's, and we could have a kind of a detailed discussion about these acts. And I think at some point we'll probably an episode to, Dedicated to Parliament trying to collect money from the colonies that they spent protecting the colonies. Um, But, you know, this freedom of press is really important, right? And so they kind of bake it into this very First Amendment. But let's, let's move to that peaceful assembly and petition the government. And then maybe we can look at all of all three parts again, kind of. We gotta look at larger. We gotta look at speech also, just in general speech, not just to the press. Right. See, I don't think the First Amendment is meant to guard anything other than your speech against the federal government. The way it's written and the way they wrote it, it's not. I don't think. Madison is advocating your right to say whatever you want to about somebody else. Oh, for sure. And and that's exactly what I wanted to get at. It's like, this is, does not mean that you're allowed to just say whatever you want. And that's been well established over time that you're not allowed right. to say whatever you want, whenever you feel like it. And I found a good quote about this um, from mm-hmm. Professor Matsuda. He writes in 1989 that, um, essentially that markets depend on the regulation of free speech in order to function. And he said that absolute protection of expression would render unconstitutional all of contract law, most of antitrust law, and much of criminal law. I thought that was so interesting. Mm-hmm. It's like, you can't just say whatever you want. Like the first amendment actually does not allow for that. And that's the thing that I find that students have the hardest time understanding. And there's a lot of contentious um, debate on college campuses right now about freedom of speech, but the first amendment does not protect you to say whatever you feel like saying, particularly in certain spaces. And I don't think students get that. They're just like freedom of speech, freedom of speech. It's like, you can't go into a crowded movie theater and yell fire. And that's the gen, that's the trope example, but it's, that's just the best example to, to say. And particularly right. in college campuses, you're not allowed to say whatever you want and especially not in the classroom. So it's right. important to flesh well, out. I mean, I'm it's, glad you made it's, that distinction. Right. It's funny. I mean, what, what form of government like is your classroom? Excuse me. What form of government? Yeah. What kind it's of not, what form of government yeah, is your classroom? Exactly. It's 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 yeah. It's it's a dictatorship. Mine is a benevolent monarchy, a la Plato's Republic. Yeah, I'm, I'm the philosopher I king. I actually am not like I'm actually pretty democratic in my classroom. To be honest, I think oh, a lot yeah. of classrooms are considered to be dictatorships, but. Halfway through the semester, they were like, we don't like what we do on Wednesdays. I was like, all right, we're not doing that on Wednesday anymore. I just like yeah. changed everything. But it you can't say whatever you want in the classroom. And it's actually like my mandate as an educator and our, our mandate as educators to to correct people when they say something that's factually incorrect. And we've touched on this a couple of different times throughout the podcast. And it's a delicate situation and balance. And I never mean to shut students down. 
but they aren't just allowed to say whatever they feel like saying. And, and they don't get that. Right. Well, I mean, it seems to them you're shutting them down and you're not valuing their opinions and things on things. Here's the thing, though. Um, you and I and other history professors have studied this stuff a long time. And we try to be really careful about what we say, and we try to kind of incorporate the latest scholarship, uh, but not just every bit of latest scholarship. We look carefully, we scrutinize new scholarship, and we decide, you know, what rises, what kind of looks like it has enough critical evidence and makes a good enough argument that this is something I feel comfortable teaching my students. And there's a lot of thought that goes into it. And it's not just us up there um, kind of preaching to the class or kind of spitting out, you know, our own personal grievances against whatever. It's, you know, we say these things and a lot of times students, I know for me, a lot of times students mistake the way I talk about knowledge as kind of this contentious place and like, you know, history is this is kind of constantly kind of not being rewritten completely, but being kind of pushed one way or the other. I think they take that to mean anything goes and they can say whatever they want. And usually, yeah, yeah go ahead. That's the importance of teaching them about making an evidence based argument because they can right. say whatever they want. I think, I mean, I let them make arguments, but they have to be steeped in evidence. You have to give me primary sources. You have to hit me with, you know, some literature. Like you're not, I don't let them just wax on about nonsense from just like, where did you hear that? Where did you get that idea? Um, what have you read that says that? And I push them to consider things in a scholarly way. And that's part of the teaching process. I think is like, you can say things, but you have to make sure that they're steeped in evidence. Right, right. So like a piece of evidence that I would use, uh, earlier discussion about religion, I made this assertion that many of the, the kind of architects of the Constitution, founding fathers, aren't particularly religious. One of the pieces of evidence I would use would be Thomas Jefferson's Bible. So he makes his own Bible. He wrote his it's own It's really Bible. small. Yeah. And it's really small. It? Well, he took everything he said was superstition out of it. Yeah. He took all – so and he he's, an actual he, – like, he based it off of the traditional New Testament. But he took out right. all of the references to Jesus' miracles or anything that was like out of the ordinary or seen as mystical. He just removed that. And then didn't he call it something like the teach the good teachings of Jesus Christ of Nazareth or something? Like because he was just looking at it from um, a morality perspective. Well that's the thing is I think that and this is I think would be also good evidence that maybe what they meant was that maybe what Madison meant was you know, you have to have this base moral morality. Uh, it's the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, that's right, that's- he also wrote the philosophy of Jesus of Nazareth, but no copies of that exist today. He also owned a Quran. He was well read yeah. and studied, and he understood religion from multiple Another- perspectives. Yeah. Right. So this would be, as an historian, these would be piece of evidence I would use to say, look, Thomas Jefferson is definitely not this super religious person who wants one religion to dominate all others in the United States. And, you know, I know that's a pretty contentious statement at this point. A lot of people, you know, the United States is founded as a Christian nation. Kind of. A lot of what is established as law and precedent and customs and tradition, all those things, yes, heavily, heavily Christian still today. But I I don't know if it was the intention of the framers. And that's like, you're right. Those are the pieces of evidence that I've presented to students to say, were they really that interested in it? You know, and really Thomas Jefferson was like his own God. I mean, this man worshiped himself. I mean, who oh yeah, and is like I'm gonna write my own Bibles. Like wow, that, 
you, um, you didn't yeah. have like a long enough list of accomplishments. Like your CV just wasn't teeming enough with, you know, strengths. You had to say, you know what? I'm going to write my own Bible too. The guy is super right. talky. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, um, yeah. Uh, so if you, uh, I just have to throw this in here because I did, I remember seeing it when I went to um, Washington, D.C. on my last research trip. Uh, it is in the National Museum of American History in the Documents Gallery. Um, and it is this little red book. And when I was there, they had it open so you could just read one page. But they've got these digital kiosks so can you, you can read it and stuff. Um, but Jefferson, I just love, I am a sect by myself as far as I know. This is what I'm saying. Like this guy, can you imagine like being on a date with this man? It'd be insufferable. <laughs> uh, I think he talks like George Costanza. I Yeah. I, guess I would think he would George refer to himself George in the third person. Has, yeah. But George Costanza has major self-esteem issues. I mean, you're thinking of like, right. Jimmy, like Jimmy's down, like that episode where the guy refers oh, to yeah. himself in the third person. Yes. But yes, yeah, I mean, he's, he is super cocky. And I want to preface that by saying though, is I love Thomas Jefferson, super flawed, has a lot of problems, but like, I do understand his importance. And I mean, we can get into that on another day, I guess, but yeah, he's, t- he's, so let's, he's a mess of a person. So let's finally, so let's get to this last part with assembly and redress of grievances kind of before we go too long on this episode. Um, so, Section two of the Virginia Declaration of Rights says all power is vested in and consequently derived from the people, semicolon, that magistrates are their trustees and servants and at all times amenable to them. And definitely the last f- part of this, to p- the right to petition the government for Doritos or grievances, is a continuation of that, right? You can kind of see the history of that back in the uh, the. English Bill of Rights, even the Magna Carta, this idea that you have a right to petition the government to get clarification on things, yeah, and it to comes make full things. Circle. Yeah, for sure. It comes right. full circle with what you talked about with the Magna Carta, because that revolutionary ideal of, you know, you actually can question what the government's doing and you do have um, – a vehicle for doing that that's really rooted in that document. And so I like that, you know, the, the tail end of it kind of comes full circle to, to discuss where really the Magna Carta does come uh, into, into play. Right. Um, so we didn't touch much on peaceful assembly. Why do you think that is? Is it self-evident what it is? I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, it's about that. I mean, I think it's an important again. It's it, but it, it's it's all right. Again, is the, the go ahead. Sorry. No, again, it's like a right that's in the First Amendment. So they clearly thought it was important. Um, but again, this is a right that gets trounced on constantly, even today. Right? I mean, what does that mean? The First Amendment says I can peacefully assemble. How can a local government then come in and say you don't have a permit? Well, the Constitution doesn't say I need a permit to assemble. No, it doesn't say it you says have the right to peaceably assemble under a permit. Right. Right. It says the right of the people peaceably to assemble. And I, I think this is, an again, an interesting thing. And one thing as kind of an historian that makes me a little uncomfortable is who the public's okay with the government banning from assembling and who they get upset when the government bans from assembling. So there's a famous it case. Time, that, though. Do what? I think it, it changes depending on the moment in time, but what case are you thinking of in particular? Well, so I'm thinking of the Nazi protest in Skokie, Illinois in 1977, right? So most Americans would be okay with the Nazis being banned from from assembling. Um, however, the Supreme Court decides in um, 
National Socialist Party of America versus Village of Skokie, um, that in fact, freedom of speech and freedom of assembly do apply and that the Village of Skokie cannot, nor can the state of Illinois, ban the National Socialist Party from assembling. Um, it reprimanded the uh, Illinois Supreme Court uh, because the Illinois Supreme Court had held lower courts ruling, upheld lower courts rulings that they could not march. And I think this is a big thing. And this gets to an issue that I think a lot of contemporary Americans have problems with. A lot of my students struggle with this as well. If we kind of expand freedom of of speech and we couple it to this idea of peaceful assembly, it means sometimes we're going to hear some pretty detestable opinions. I mean, I'm witness to that every single day on campus. So, yeah. yeah. And, you know, what's the solution to that? Do we go back to an older, maybe 19th century reading of freedom of speech? Or do we kind of accept it as a reality of living in kind of a pluralistic contempt, uh, modern society? And I, you know, I, what do you think about that? For me, I think it boils down to the burden, the financial burden to the taxpayer. So for example, um, when I was at Penn State, there was a speaker who came to campus who was very uh, contested. Like nobody not nobody, a lot of people did not want this individual to come and speak on campus. I'm not going to say who it was, but there were protests uh, when he arrived. And so there was a large group of students who wanted to go see him speak. There was a large group of students who were protesting outside and like kicking the doors down basically. And this was back in 2016, I want to say. And right. what ended up boiling down to is like the cost to secure the event at a state school fell on the taxpayer. And I think that if people right. understood how much it cost to pay for security for these sorts of events, I think that people would be so much more hesitant to just give carte blanche to these speakers. And I have to say that uh, I'm getting some of these ideas from a, a forthcoming book. It's called The Contested Campus aligning professional values, social justice, and free speech. It's coming December 2019. And, and these ideas are discussed in the book to, to kind of flesh out what does free speech on a college campus look like? What are the legal ramifications? What are the financial implications? Um, and so some of these ideas I'm gleaning from that book, and I would recommend it. It's really interesting for thinking 21st century speech issues, but that's for me what it boils down to. It's just like, what is the financial burden of protecting this speech? Because it can it can cause like rioting. I mean, think about Charlottesville. Somebody was killed. Right. And and initially there was a peaceful assembly, but at what point does it stop being peaceful? And at what point do law enforcement have to intervene? And that to what cost to the taxpayer to facilitate some of this madness? And I mean madness on both sides of the aisle, because in the 1960s, of course, there was a lot going on, you know, with protests to the war and the free speech movement at Berkeley. And also, I mean, to me, this doesn't boil down to a partisan issue, but you do have to ask questions about what does this cost society literally in dollars and cents? Right. I think it's a good point, right? I mean, it's, there's kind of a logistical issue with it, but I mean, part of me, I don't know. Part of me is just like, you know, um, maybe it's the price you have to pay or I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a sticky situation, right? And it's complicated issue because I think a lot of us are worried about once we start saying, well, this group can't protest or this group can't appear to speak because the cost to the community is going to be so huge to kind of protect them 
um, or to maybe keep peace because of protests that will arise, we can't allow them to speak. I mean, it becomes an easy way to shut down public discourse is, you know, if you find out somebody's coming to speak, if you just can get enough of your friends together and make a big stink about it, that person won't be able to speak because they'll be able to kind of say there's this burdensome cost. Yeah, it's um, definitely a slippery slope. And I, and I think if you start setting a precedent, um, it can backfire on people as well that, who you know, you, you start to kind of make these judgments on one group and then it's going to affect another group and then it kind of snowballs into this bigger issue where before you know it, you're right. Maybe, maybe that freedom to assemble and freedom to speech ends up being curtailed. It, it's such a sticky subject that I don't have the answer to it. And I do see both sides of the, the coin, but I think right now it's contentious in different ways than it was 10 years ago and maybe will be in 10 years. And so I think the importance of the debate at the moment is to remember that no matter what policy ends up being enacted now, like it will come down the pipeline potentially to bite you. And so right. maybe not to make major judgment calls on it at the moment. Um, but it's certainly a huge issue on college campuses and that's, that's the big, right. that's the big thing because they're publicly funded. Right. So if you have somebody just standing on a street corner, that's a little bit different because yes, there's still a cost to the public, I guess, but it's like, is the college campus, the space where they are left to foot the bill for something along those lines? And the answer may be yes. Right. The answer may be like, absolutely. That's what college campuses are for. But the answer may be no, you know, we actually need to spend more money on um, accessibility and housing and health care for our students or any number of things that college campuses could pump money into that aren't security. And so it's a, it's really complicated. Yeah, I think that's the thing is, is college campuses are, you know, are these traditionally since the 1960s, not really before then, free speech spaces. Um, but, you know, in places like that, they do have a right to kind of protect the students and kind of things like that. Um, but kind of for the Nazi party versus Skokie, it's not a college campus, right? It's a, it's a municipality. It's a city. And I think that's why the Supreme Court says you can't stop it there, right? You have to allow it to happen. Whereas... Um, a person doesn't have freedom of speech, um, within their company necessarily, right. Or within a corporation or within any kind of institution, um, you may not have freedom of speech. You might be allowed it, but you know, it's not automatic. Um, but I think it's, it's one reason it's really important to look at these, this bill of rights and really think about them, um, because they are so important um, I mean, any last words no I'm really excited to go on to the next uh, the next bill of right right second amendment oh yeah and I yeah I mean uh, next one is going to be the second amendment right yeah and that's thanks to loyal listener Katie in North Carolina she was the one who suggested that we cover the second amendment and then we started talking about it and said you know what we should cover all of them. And so we're going to cover the second next week, but we do listen to suggestions. And if you do, you know, have something that you're interested in learning more about, please let us know. And we're really open to um, going in the direction that's most beneficial to our listeners. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's the thing is, um, you know, I want this to be useful. I mean, we've talked about this. We want this to be what people want to hear. Uh, it's what they want to learn about. Um, and I, you know, I think this is, this is great. I think it's a great start to this. So, uh, well, can't wait till the next one. Second amendment. That should be fun. Uh, I'm Jeff. And I'm Hillary. Thanks for joining us this week on an incomplete history. Make sure you join us next week as we continue our discussion of the bill of rights. Um, uh, 
if you haven't uh, rated us on Apple Podcast, please do so. Leave us a review there. Also, if you enjoy our podcast, you can go to our website, unincompletehistory.com. And you can leave comments there. You can also find show notes. Uh, you can read a little bit more about uh, the two of us. Uh, additionally, um, we are going to be available on YouTube starting this week. So look us up on there. There'll be a link on our homepage that takes you to YouTube. Uh, that's another place you can kind of listen to our episode. Uh, we may at some point do some kind of live uh, stream there. Uh, we're still kind of working out the details for that. Also, we have a Patreon link up on our homepage. Click on that if you want to shoot us a few bucks to help us uh, cover the production cost of an incomplete history. Uh, until next time, thank you very much. Have a good day. <laughs>